here from Chital, um, <coughs> who is going to talk to us about the rebound effect. And uh, I particularly have a very, uh, and sort of John, um, and you and I are responsible for oversight on the Institute for Energy Efficiency. And we have a particular interest in this talk today because um, one could, in a rather negative, uh, pessimistic perspective, conclude that rebound would say that uh, a lot of what we're doing in the Institute for Energy Efficiency is uh, either, one, not what we think it is, or two, going to have much less impact because the rebound effect is often not taken into account. Um, people, you know, <clears throat> we all talk about making cars more efficient, buildings more efficient, but the problem is that if an automobile has much better mileage, people will just drive more and drive bigger cars, right? Same is true with buildings uh, that are more efficient. People will build bigger buildings. And that's what she thought was going to talk to us about today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. But first, let me mention that our next uh, seminar in this series, Linda's smiling at me, she's reminding me I have to be good. So <laughs> our next seminar in this series is two weeks from today in this room. And Richard King from Spectrolab will be talking about some very exciting new work in uh, solar cells. He works for the vision of Boeing. Uh, which is Spectrolab uh, in LA. And uh, it is a uh, uh, company that does a lot of work for NASA, the space based solar cells. And they are making multi junction solar cells as we are here at UCSB. And they have currently actually the world's record, uh, something like 42%. They've just edged out NREL recently. And, uh, and they're continuing to work on that. So I think you'll find that talk quite interesting, very different than the talk we have today. Um, well, go back to um, graduated uh, with a uh, joint degree, a bachelor's degree uh, in physics uh, from uh, Xavier College and the University of Mumbai, India, and then did a, a BA in journalism and mass communication from the University of Pune, uh, also in India in 1991. And then she completed an MBA from Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, um, and has worked for Texas Instruments and Zilinx. Uh, in San Jose. And in 2009, she's a devil for more education, decided <laughs> to go for another degree, joined us here at the Brand School, enrolled uh, in the PhD program, working with Roland Geyer. And uh, we're going to hear from Chanel now about the rebound effect. Please. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sheetal. And I am standing here on behalf of Roland and myself. I will be talking about rebound effect. Um, Roland is also my advisor. <laughs> and before I joined Roland last year, uh, I had about a four months period between my job and the beginning of PhD. And that's where this uh, you know, re project fit in very nicely. And we did this report for the institute. So this presentation is actually a brief of our project report, which is available on the White Room uh, if you want to know the details. So I would like to start um, with, I'm going to go that side, more comfortable that way. Uh, let's start with a quote uh, from, uh, from Wall Street Journal. What if, what if drivers who find that they can go longer on a tank of gas, drive more. Would all that additional driving cancel out the environmental benefits? And that concern is really at the heart of rebound debate. What it is, we'll see in this presentation. So we've, I've organized it, uh, we'll go with the concept uh, look at the classification, uh, go through the mechanisms of what drives rebound effect, and then we'll see whether we need to worry about it or not. And maybe you'll have to draw your own conclusion at the end of the talk. Now, uh, let's go to the concept. The quote that I just shared with you from Wall Street Journal, that's not the first time that we are thinking about it. Uh, Century and a half ago, a very prominent economist of his time, William Stanley Jevons, he observed 
that England's consumption of coal was going up in spite of the efficiency increase in the steam engines. That is the time when James Watt um, uh, improved the efficient steam engines and Jevons claimed that any further increase in efficiency would deplete England's deposits of coal. And so there is a paradox. On one hand, you have increase in efficiency, which is supposed to reduce the resource consumption. On the other hand, he was saying that it's going to do just the opposite. And that is Jevons' paradox. Anybody who touches the topic of rebound has to know this quote. This is from his book uh, from 1865, The Coal Question. It's a very famous quote. And this says that it is a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to diminished consumption. The very contrary is the truth. Now, fast forward to 1980s. This is the time, late 70s, 80s, this is the time uh, greenhouse gas uh, environmental degradation was coming on the forefront. And policymakers and governments were looking at technological efficiency enhancement as a remedy, um, as a key to tackle that problem. So Len Brooks in UK, another economist, um, he claimed that any attempt to reduce energy consumption by increasing efficiency would eventually raise the demand. Independently of Brooks, another uh, economist right here in California, Gazoom, he noted that uh, at that time, California Energy Commission uh, had issued some mandatory performance standards for household appliances. And Kazum said that rebound was ignored in those manda uh, mandatory requirements. These two people working independently uh, revoked what, uh, sorry, evoked what uh, Jevons had implied a century and a half ago. Harry Saunders took what Kazum's, Brooks, Jevons, he, well this up until now, it was all just speculation and talk, but Saunders really for the first time took all that and put it into a theoretical framework. And he proposed a postulate, and this is again something very, very important for anybody who wants to uh, know about rebound, a rebound, it's called K postulate. And it says that with fixed energy price, energy efficiency gains will increase energy consumption above where it, it would be without these gains. Simply speaking, the e energy, energy efficiency gains that are uh, supposed to be in effect at micro level will probably get wiped out at macro level. So the rebound effect is nothing but a uh, paradox, and it's reflective of a KB postulate, and it's rooted in economics. And you can see this lot of words. But really, it is this. You have some expected energy savings. These are engineering estimates. But then, because now you have energy efficiency, there is some behavioral response there which is taking out some of the expected sa energy savings. Your eventual energy gain is going to be less than your expected energy savings. So that's rebound effect. Let's see some about the classification. Well, there are three main types. Um, this is, by the way, this is not, there is no formal definition of rebound. There is no formal classification of rebound. But after you read 50, 60, 70 papers, this kind of, uh, this picture kind of emerges as uh, a general consensus. So there is direct rebound where the efficiency enhancement and rebound are within the same service type or within the same energy sector. That's direct rebound. 
indirect rebound is where your energy efficiency is in one area but you feel the rebound in another area so that's indirect and then finally you have economy wide so if you have an eff efficiency improvement or service improvement which is so profound that it's going to generate new business it's going to grow economy it's going to make your lifestyle changes then you're probably going to have economy wide uh, rebound effect now this is in fact the kb postulate which is at the heart of rebound effect it's really the economy wide rebound that everybody is worried about the backfire is the extreme case of rebound your rebound is so big that it's going to eat up all your expected energy savings and you're probably going to have energy consumption that is more than before and that's your backfire now if you put it on the scale of complexity and time then rebound effect is here which is more restricted to one energy sector and on the other hand you have economy wide rebound which is really a, a macro phenomenon but then there are certain mechanisms that are supposed to drive them now for example let's look at direct rebound uh, and this is this research is very well rooted in economics uh, income effect or substitution effect are there any economists here okay <laughs> all right uh, all right so let's let's look at them let's say um, let's take an example of transportation uh, cars become more efficient and so people drive more that's direct rebound basically you have your if you can do the same thing in less money in less resources then you have some leftover resource and you use it in the same sector and that's your direct rebound via income effect another thing is substitution effect now think about uh, manufacturing uh, you use energy you use labor you use capital in production your efficiency becomes so high that you decide to replace your labor with your with your uh, machine because of your energy efficiency so now instead of people doing that job the machine is is doing that job because it became more efficient so you just substituted your labor with your machine and that then you're eventually going to increase your energy consumption because you're making the machine do more and that's substitution effect but your energy increase is still in the same area that you have uh, efficiency increase then you have indirect rebound which is said to have driven by secondary effect and em embedded energy effect what's that well um, your gas is cheaper you have some leftover money and you use it to do something else may you buy some more food maybe you buy some new equipment something and so by doing that you are causing the you you are generating collectively people are generating uh, consuming more in some other sectors of energy and that secondary effect and what is embedded energy well that's the energy that's needed to implement the efficiency when you have efficient tv uh, efficient tvs efficient uh, cars efficient refrigerators efficient anything sometimes well you need to first make them and then you may have you may need to do something else at the consumer end in order to use them and if you if you need to take any additional steps in order to implement or incorporate those energy efficiencies then there is an embedded energy in those efforts and that's indirect rebound and lastly the economy wide rebound and this is really what i as i mentioned before the growth in economy go back to the uh, steam engine example that i gave 
with the efficiency enhancement in the steam engine, our lives changed. We are, and that's another. That's one example of economy-wide rebound. Or, for example, um, when we could make small uh, lamps that are inside refrigerators or inside microwaves. Uh, when we had those, um, there's a new industry like security industry that opened up. And so eventually, we are using more energy. And that's economy-wide rebound. Now let's, I would like to uh, look at or share some of the studies that are done in this field. Uh, but first, a few notes about this research in rebound. Uh, first of all, uh, the enhancement in <coughs> efficiency is expected to reduce prices. And the equally important to understand that the consumer response doesn't differentiate between reduction in price and increase in efficiency. What that means is the studies that are done uh, reflect they treat reduction in price same as uh, increase in efficiency. Or if you have reduction in price without increase in efficiency, it's still going to give you the same results. Uh, the other thing is it's an empirical research, not experimental. Uh, the history is same for everybody. It's a matter of how you look at the data. And it's based in the assumptions. And thirdly, it's the research is rooted in economics. And, these are, and I'll come back to this point uh, in the next few slides. It's all about elasticity, the elasticity of demand, the elasticity of price, uh, and income elasticity. And I will come back to that when I, when I look at the re in the next couple of slides. So uh, when you look at direct rebound, most of the studies are done in the transportation and residential heating and cooling. The main observations are that if there is an unsatisfied demand or if there is income elasticity, then you are going to see some rebound. That I think is pretty logical. If you have a um, People will, people will use service more uh, if there is an unsatisfied demand. For example, develop, developing economies, in developing economies, you will see more of that rebound. Or if there is a household that needed to use more of the service and could not do it before, then you are going to see more rebound there. And income elasticity, what that means is um, now that you have leftover resource, because you have energy efficiency, uh, that resource will be used. If that resource is important, then that will be used more when there is leftover uh, resource. Is this getting confusing? No. OK. Um, so the key to remember is that unsatisfied demand will show more rebound. And I think it's. Hopefully, this is uh, logical enough. Uh, here are some results from the personal transport. The key point is that um, the research, well, there are different ways to do. As I mentioned, this is all empirical, uh, this is all, uh, empirical research. And no matter which methodology is used, generally speaking, in the short term, the rebound shows to be about, about 30 percent. In the long term, rebound can go as high as 65 percent, but it's mostly driven by the economies that still have the demand for the, for this is personal transportation, so they still have the demand for transportation, unsatisfied demand for transportation. And that's why you see, that's why this number is driven high by the countries where there is unsatisfied demand. You see the similar trend reflected in this was in India. Um, but these studies are um, 
lot of these studies are done by US transportation studies mostly are done in the US and uh, these studies the heating household heating studies are done mostly in the Scandinavian countries a lot of them so you can also see that pattern um, or even within the US if we are talking about efficiency in household heating then you are probably going to see more rebound on the east coast than on the west coast because we have more moderate weather here. Um, so this it's coming it's coming back to unsatisfied demand. Again ballpark is again 30 to 60 percent with 60 percent being the upper bound and uh, that's from the areas where there is higher unsatisfied demand. Let's look at the indirect rebound. Now there aren't that many studies in indirect rebound because it's difficult uh, to put boundaries around it as opposed to direct rebound where you know that it's within the same area. Uh, the main uh, thing in the indirect rebound is that the proponents of indirect uh, the uh, the opponents of indirect rebound say that energy costs make smaller share of overall expenditure because the main premise of indirect rebound is that when you have leftover resource resource which is mainly money you are going to spend it somewhere else but some researchers say that well we are not paying that much for energy and so there isn't going to be that much leftover money or money saved because of energy efficiency so you don't have much to spend somewhere else but the two stu the two studies that i'm going to present next they don't tell the same story uh, the the first study was done uh, in 2007 by uh, Brandland and it's an econometric model of aggregate household expenditure of 13 goods and services. So what they did is they looked at the direct and indirect rebound uh, of 20 percent energy efficiency increase in Swedish households. But what they did is they didn't stop at energy they took it to they took it step further uh, and looked at the greenhouse gases. So if you have 20 percent efficiency increase in transportation and heating and if you have money left over where will you spend it and what how would that translate into greenhouse gas effects. And they found that there will be a backfire or not found but they predicted that there will be a backfire and that can only be countered by a higher carbon tax so that was their conclusion. Mizobuchi in the same uh, year took the took use the same methodology and basically replicated that for the Japanese household and he came to the same conclusion except when he considered the capital cost the cost to implement or the cost to assimilate the energy if the efficiency the 20 percent efficiency then his rebound reduced from backfire to 27 percent. But what is not clear from his report is what he what he did with the embedded energy was that was that a factor or not is not very clear from that report but at least at least it's clear that uh, when the cost of implementation when the capital cost was considered the backfire came down to 27 percent rebound. So these are two very widely reported studies in the indirect rebound and at least it shows that when you take it to greenhouse gases and do not stop at energy you will see some rebound and it is at, it's at minimum it matches the empirical numbers of um, direct rebound. So let's look, look at economy wide rebound. So the focus here is really the role the energy plays and not the cost of energy. What role the electricity pay, uh, plays 
in uh, the, the growth of economy or what role the steam engine played uh, in the role of growth in productivity and growth in economy. And did that somehow cause increase in energy use? And that's really the crux of economy-wide rebound. The problem here is that although everybody agrees on the general line of thinking, there is not consensus on the theories behind it. So depending on, it's, it's a macroeconomics, and depending on your assumptions on elasticity, uh, and production functions, the predictions will vary. So the predicted range for economy-wide rebound is as low as 30 some percent to as high as backfire. What's important there is that the, the results, the studies, or the models that predicted backfire, they had energy playing more important role in the overall dynamics. So those models where energy forms an important export-import commodity, that's where they saw the rebound, a very large rebound. The problem though is that if there is an economy-wide rebound, then backfire becomes a possibility. So do we worry about it? Or do we not worry about it? Well, if in, in post-efficiency enhancement, if you don't see energy uh, usage increase, then we don't have to worry. And this is the position maintained by Lee Shipper and Howard. And these are um, important names to remember. And then we have reason to worry if energy use is higher post-efficiency enhancement. Uh, but how do we decide what is pre-efficiency and post-efficiency? I would like to share this graph, this, uh, yeah, this data with you. This is long-term energy savings. Now, this is the actual energy usage. This is the US data. This is actual energy usage. And this is hypothetical energy use without energy efficiency improvements. And the savings are about 58%. Now the question is this. This hypothetical use, how did they come up with this? Would we be at this level of energy if we did not have development? And is that development, how is that connected with energy efficiency improvement? In other words, what role energy efficiency enhancement or what role energy had in the development. So that question is where it's not clear. What, whether whether so that question is going to determine whether it's 58% or whether it was just 10% or what it was. So again, if the increase in efficiency enhancement plays significant role in development, which is, it could be growth in GDP or incomes, or perhaps even population. If increase in energy efficiency has have something to do with GDP, income, population, uh, then, then, we, then it will increase the eventual energy consumption. But if that's not true, it's not true, but if, if, but, if, but if energy doesn't have much role to play in, techno, in the development of economy and productivity, then we probably don't need to worry too much about it. Uh, now, this is again US data. This is energy per capita. Now, policy-wise, energy efficiencies are essential part of, of uh, taking an economy uh, through development without necessarily growing energy consumption. So from that respect, uh, the energy efficiency and the related policy measures seem, seem to have 
kept that kept a uh, kept that under control and the another measure to look at it is from energy intensity index index what energy intensity uh, does is energy intensity is kind of another way of measuring energy efficiency uh, just plain energy intensity is how much energy an economy is using uh, to get one unit of GDP. But the difference, the problem there is that uh, developed countries, developed economies do have higher use of energy and developing economies do have lower use of overall uh, energy consumption patterns. So you somehow have to take the developed and developing factor out of it in order to measure uh, the, the true uh, effect of energy efficiency. And that's done uh, with the index, uh, energy intensity index. And if you see here, if you just look at um, energy per GDP, this is this line, which, which indicates that US is uh, using much less energy to um, for one unit to produce one unit of GDP. But this line will tell you that, uh, well, this is there because we are not doing production here, but we are still using the products that somebody else is making. And when you consider that, your energy efficiency index, energy intensity index is this green line. So this is another indication that uh, economy is growing uh, with with steady energy intensity index, with steady uh, energy per capita, uh, and that's where energy efficiency is working. But the problem is actually this. Our total energy is still going high, because these are still per capita measures, and this is overall energy consumption. And I guess that's, where, that's why there is a concern about um, rebound. So to conclude, uh, again, the rebound effect is the, the expected savings uh, reduced by the behavioral impact to the uh, energy efficiency. The direct and indirect rebound are roughly in the range of 30 to 50 percent, but it's really not about direct and indirect rebound, it's really about uh, economy-wide rebound. No studies from direct and reba indirect rebound has, uh, has given backfire. So the efficiency increase is still working, but the problem is that if there is an economy-wide rebound, then, um, then there is a concern. Now some rebound, again, is probably expected, inevitable, and maybe is, is even okay because we have a lot of unsatisfied demand worldwide. And um, it's a cost of progress. And that can happen only with efficiency enhancement, energy efficiency. So the concerns are really the unjustified backfire. And the crux of the argument is in resolution of role of energy in economy and development. So the technological solutions are still at the heart of energy conservation efforts, but the eventual goal is absolute and not per capita. And that's why the public awareness and policy measures like the cap on total usage or the carbon taxes, they need to supplement the technology to minimize the effect of rebound. And that's the conclusion. Any questions? Um, yeah. So it's very clear. Uh, oh, thank you. The crux of all this seems to be that the, there's a percentage that applies to whether the change is large or small. And that seems wrong to me. Right? So you, know, you said it's either 30% or 60% or 100%. So take fiber optics as an example. So it used to be we would talk to each other now we text to each other. So as fiber optics has become cheaper and more efficient, we use more electricity. So that uh, seems to be undeniably true. So the, the, it, 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 I, I would argue it's probably backfired for sure. But at some point, if 
the fiber optics get even cheaper and, and more energy efficient, then we don't fly to meetings, we just have you know, teleconferences. Yeah. So we don't go to blockbusters, yeah. we just watch movies. Yeah. So the, the, the answer may change and may depend on the size of the change. It's not, it's not just a number. Yes, absolutely. You're right. I, because um, and now you're again talking about the lifestyle change, and there is going to be, uh, it's going to replace something. And if what it replaces was more energy intensive, then there is a gain. And, and, I, that's, and that's the whole problem, because you cannot do experiments here. You just have to wait and see how the data emerges. And uh, that's no reason to stop energy efficiency. That's my whole point, because you, there is still a lot we can do. There is a lot of unsatisfied demand. And there is, but the problem is, if you are not aware that that's going to happen, um, especially on um, on day to day level, if people are not aware that they are using more gas because it became cheaper, then they are going to drive more. So that's unnecessary uh, unnecessary rebound. If there is really no need for driving, then you need to stop driving, even though gas has become cheaper. So, makes sense. Yeah. I have a question about you mentioned. Uh, the appliance standards that, uh, especially those that went in in California in the 1970s, um, and that there was a criticism apparently by uh, someone who said that uh, at that time there was no consideration of uh, rebounds. Uh, people often point to that as being a rather exemplary uh, illustration of energy efficiency, the fact that if you look at California's energy use per capita, it just flattened out after 1970. It's been pretty constant since then. Can you comment on that, and, <clears throat> and it, has there been any estimate of how much better that could have been, uh, or how much rebound plays a role in that? Because it looks like it was a very effective program, and maybe there's just not a lot of demand for more refrigerators, is that it? Yeah, I mean, once you have one refrigerator or two, yeah. you cannot have three, right? right? So, but, that, but that's direct. Now, if you have, I mean, the whole point of contention is that now if you have, if you're using less electricity, uh, and if you see some, some difference in your bill, where are you going to spend that extra money? But the problem is we don't spend, spend that much on electricity. Our electricity bills are not so much. So $5 chain, uh, difference or $10, you're not going to see anywhere. But, but that's when those uh, Brundtland, when they did study in Sweden, and when they, instead of looking at the energy, they, they looked at the spending patterns. And are you going to eat more meat with those $10 or whatever, or, you know, buy? Then, then how is it going to show up in your greenhouse, in your carbon footprint? Then it might be a different story. So. It all comes back to behavior, doesn't it? Yeah. Which is why economics is so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm very much relieved I'm not, that I'm not this economist. Energy efficiency is, is, is mission is still going to be important <laughs> from your comments. Other questions? Uh, why it 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 depends. I I mean you there there's certainly we can educate people and you know people have been changing behavior as you can see uh, when uh, things hit home. But uh, it still is still um, it has to come close to home. I mean it cannot cannot be abstraction. Uh, people believe in global warming warming only when they see havoc in local weather patterns. Right. So. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but certain things you won't do more once, uh, like for example, the gas becomes expensive, you might cancel your trip to Grand Canyon. But even if it's free, you won't go there twice. So your, your behavioral response uh, to delta also will be di difficult depending on its plus delta or minus delta and how your demand is. Uh, now, what you do with the leftover money is, again, do you have any unsatisfied demand in some other area? And your unsatisfied demand is going to be different from somebody 
uh, somewhere else. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, I mean, if, if you did, did you do carbon accounting class? No, never mind. So I mean, the, the whole point is if you know you are conserving something, and if you stop that resource at the doorstep before it goes out, and if you invest it uh, wisely, if you, if you know you are going to save $15 per, per, per month because of this, then if you invest that in some uh, proper cause, then you are trapping that resource and you are you're preventing your personal rebound. Make sense? Yeah. So, so get, what happens when you include um, carbon taxes, for example? Uh, there's a very interesting experiment in British Columbia, which you might know about, where they put a, a tax on fuels, gasoline, heating oil, and things of that sort. And then they're feeding some of that back into the economy, um, and either investing it in renewables or actually feeding it back as a subsidy to low-income groups because of the uh, uh, aggressive nature of the tax. How does, how does, I mean, that changes behavior a lot, right? Yeah. How does that, how does rebound play into a circumstance like that where you have a carbon tax? I think that, that anybody look at that? Uh, no, but I think that, that'll, that'll cap it, right? If you put a lid on your overall consumption, um, well, Simply it's saying just, it's like a quota. Incrementally more. But yeah, I, I think it's sort of the main idea behind the sort of ecological tax reform that you know sort of is yes. popular in, in, in parts of Europe. And I think in the the way it relates to rebound is the idea that you um, uh, you, you drive energy efficiency and at the same time make the energy more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the net cancels out, so actually there is no, no, no total cost change, which would then basically mean that there, can, there cannot be a rebound, because it's in cost the same. Right. So, you can, so you're basically, yeah. you know, right. instead of getting 20 miles per gallon, yeah. you know, and, and you had 220 uh, yeah. dollars per gallon, you now get uh, miles per gallon, the wrong way around, but you can do it. Um, you know, you get 40 miles per gallon, but now you can pay four dollars per gallon. Yeah. The net, you still pay the same amount of money. So if you kind of yeah. put those things together, nothing changes. You accomplish a lot of efficiency. The, the, only, the only problem is, of course, the, so the, attraction, the individual attraction sort of disappears. Yeah. You know, that why, why should I be interested in, in energy efficiency if sort of that carrot of, of cost savings disappears? I mean, very often we sort of, that's sort of the big carrot that we put in front of, you know, yeah. consumers' noses is say, you know, Yes, it's good for the planet, but hey, you think about the money you can save. Well, if you raise the prices first, then we'll buy the energy efficient car. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, even, you know, Germany tried a very, very modest increase, and they were basically, it's exactly what they tried. They said, raise the price first, and then the efficiency improvement will, will come. So do it that way around. But it's very hard to, you know, to push that through. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's why policies are important. You can do it at policy level. You know, you can put a, a cap on total usage. Uh, it may not be politically viable, but okay, your usage should not go. Your use of electricity or gas should not go beyond certain. Other questions. What if you completely cut off the fossil fuels and everything is completely covered in space and where everything is, um, you know, it's a massive source of power and it's, uh, it has all those zero, you know, gas energy. Then uh, seeing that it can, I mean, the power source is almost unlimited and uh, then again, our, um, 
say the consumption of energy again will go up. So where do you think that we don't have to come into play that? Because there is nothing negative coming out of it. But at the same time, your energy consumption is going up because you have a limited source of power. So you are talking about if we if we just replace so uh, if we replace uh, fossil fuel completely with solar energy, then where is the rebound? Um, that might be. F I mean, again, it's it's hypothetical, right? If you if you can just do everything with solar energy and the machinery that takes to run it, if it if it's not uh, taking, uh, you know, if if it's if it's not uh, uh, an overpowering faction, then it might be okay. It's, it's, these things are very case specific. Even the economy wide rebound, uh, it, it's very case specific. You cannot take result from one and you transfer on the, onto the other because what type of energy and what's infrastructure needed to keep it running and what it's going to replace and what it's going to generate, it's so technology specific that. Um, not just greenhouse gas emissions, we should be worried about there are all kinds of other impacts. You know, like you know, people now talk when it comes to renewable energy, people start talking worried about land use. So they you know they have this notion of energy sprawl and there are sort of calculations out there just how much biomass you need to grow in order to make a significant dent into US gasoline consumption and it's, it's a frightening amount of, of land area. So you know, it's not just about climate change. Yeah. You alluded to a couple of ways of controlling human behavior. One of them is taxation, another is by capping total uh, consumption. Do, do you think differently about controlling behavior, for example, by um, government legislation that limit, that, that um, forces car companies, for example, to increase their average gas mileage, the cafe standards, and so on? Do you think of that as in the same way as simply capping the total energy usage, or does that have a more desirable effect? So you're you're talking about now again uh, making cars more efficient. Yeah, making cars yeah. more efficient, mandating yeah. that cars so, make them more efficient. Yeah, and so that's that's going to help if if somebody needs to drive regardless of efficiency. If I have to drive hundred, you know, twenty miles regardless of efficiency, then it's going to help me. But because now it's efficient, instead of 20, I'm going to start driving 30 miles. Then it's going to eat up. And, th and that's rebound. But, it's not but, but it's still better, let's say, if, if, but if, let's say I need to drive 20 miles every day, but I can afford to drive only 10. Now that efficiency is helping me to do 20. So that's going to help. Um, but but so that so that's rebound, but that's justifiable, and that you know that's okay. Uh, so we still need efficiency. We still need that if we want more people to be able to do what we need to do. Makes sense. Now, this, as I mentioned, this is yeah, this is all empirical. I mean, you cannot have controlled experiments in this. What you can just do is, is you you take your data points uh, sensibly. I mean, um, it's 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 past and it's open to everyone, regardless of. Um, and that you can you can do surveys or you can just look at the time series data. So, uh, but you cannot control experiments. So it's it, that's that's the problem. It's you cannot control the variables. You just have to take what it is and make sense out of it. 
just have one more question. Just curious, maybe follow up on this question if there's any, any analysis so far. If people buy a more efficient car going to this uh, fuel efficiency standard and the Wall Street Journal come back, um, do they tend to drive twice as far? Do people tend to move twice as far away from where they work so they can take advantage of driving more for the same fuel? Or, you know, is there, it, it seems like that's a big part of driving is commuting. Is there any evidence that people change behavior just deliberately so you, so, yes. so you mean do people change is there any evidence that people change their behavior to accommodate efficiency um, you will not you will not decidedly drive twice twice as much uh, if you can uh, if you want to but uh, the whole the data shows that people do drive a little bit more so that's why that 30% number comes from the developed economies where uh, the, most of the demand is satisfied, but people just unconsciously do it more because now they can. In, in, uh, but there's still, there still that 60 some, uh, 70% energy efficiency gain you have. 30% is taken away, but you still have 70%. Now in the, in the developing economies where there is large unsatisfied demand, uh, for them, it's it's even if it's backfire, it's it's still uh, it's still better than what they would do otherwise, and that's why efficiency and technical efficiency is important because overall, you know, we need to raise the standard of living. So what would be really cool, maybe this app exists, I don't know, but if you had an app that, that just tracked your travel, so it, it could tell if you know, cell phone, if you were flying or on an airplane, in an airplane or in a train, in a car, or walking, it could tell, right? Yeah. So by, by your movement and location. So that could then calculate your uh, carbon footprint. Yeah. Um, and then if you actually tie in all your credit card data, and, and what you're consuming, mm -hmm. you definitely calculate it. Everyone, everyone, everyone's uh, carbon footprint is calculated. And if you especially publish that, yeah. <laughs> you have a huge impact. Yeah, you're right. right. Yeah, so I like that. You didn't publish it. You just, you just it automatically calculated it for you. Yeah. You're like, wow, that was really bad this week. Yeah. Put it on your yeah, put it on the Facebook. Put it on Facebook. Make it required. <laughs> yeah. So again, okay, it comes back to awareness, right? If you're aware what you're doing, then you will not probably do it. So, so there, are, there are websites that calculate your footprint, right? Okay. Data. Are there any that calculate it automatically? Well, you have to put the data in. Yeah. There are lots that will do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it depends on your, your behavior. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's been a great discussion. Uh, it, it, economics seems to generate more questions than physics. There must be something there. Let's thank you. Thank you.